Good morning, everybody. Well, the royal wedding is absolutely dominating everything. One Sunday newspaper has 47 pages of photographs. And if you look across other news media, radio, television this morning, there's almost a competition going on from public figures to sort of outbid each other in saying how wonderful the whole day was. Well, it was rather special. I was down there on Thursday, 48 hours before. I thought the atmosphere was quite extraordinary. I think the whole thing is a magnificent advert for the country. The weather was perfect. And sure, there's lots to talk about. And we will talk about it from somebody who was there yesterday but other things are going on and there's a really I think very big story out there and you'd struggle if you went through today's newspapers to really find it the Sunday Times have done more on it than anybody else but it's what's going on in Italy often we get the impression in this country from those that wish us to remain in the European Union and would like to force a second referendum on us that we're the ones with the problem but everything in Brussels and across the EU is hunky-dory. Well, it's not, is it? Remember Catalonia. Remember what's going on with Poland, with Hungary. Big arguments with the European Commission. But tomorrow, a new government will be formed in Italy. It is made up of the Lega, uh, who before were the Northern uh, League. They now uh, they dropped the Northern bit in a bid to get votes across the whole of Italy. Um, and they're joining up with the Five Star Movement. The Lega are on the right of politics, Five Star are just a bit to the left. I know both of these parties very well. I sat for 10 years in the European Parliament with the Lega, and I currently sit with the Five Star Movement, um, and the founder of it, Beppe, Beppe Grillo and I did a deal back in 2014. We have before seen a government in Greece elected saying that it would break all of the rules, and then, in the face of Brussels deciding not to. I wonder, how significant is this Italian government tomorrow? And to help us through that, I'm going to go to Peter Foster, Europe editor of the Daily Telegraph. Good morning, Peter. Good morning, Nigel. How big a moment do you believe this is? I think, potentially, it's an enormous moment. Uh, I'm delighted to, that you're, you're leading the show with it. I, I think uh, uh, that will look like a wise decision in a few months' time. Uh, you know, since the financial, the bond crisis in 2012, uh, as you know, there's just been a succession of technocratic uh, governments in Italy, uh, starting with Mario Monti, which has sort of masked the fact that Italy, which is the third biggest country in the Eurozone, has fallen out with Euro of love with Europe in a spectacular fashion. And this government uh, will give an extraordinary mouthpiece uh, to that. The extent to which, as you say, they can break the rules mm. uh, from Brussels is going to be fascinating. You know, they've they're introducing uh, in their programme at least a minimum income. They want to uh, scrap the pension reforms, which were seen as the sort of benchmark of Italian structural reforms. If, if they did everything that they the, have in their programme, uh, they'd see the budget deficit hit nearly 6% of GDP, as you know. That's <laughs> which, is, twice. which is double what they're allowed yes, to do. <laughs> which is double what they're allowed to do. And you saw the bond markets tightening pretty hard uh, uh, the back end of last week. So, you know, there will be a standoff, I think, between the markets, sell off on the Italian stock market as well by by internationals. But I think that the really key thing here is that um, even if the, the leaders are unable to push through a lot of these policies, you know, when, when, when they, they start to hit the kind of reality buffer, guess who they're going to blame? They're going to blame the Ayatollahs of austerity uh, in Brussels. They're going to blame wow. uh, a German-led They're, they're going to blame the Germans, that, aren't they? Yeah, they're going to blame the Germans. And, <laughs> yeah. and, and it's going to be messy. And, you know, as you said at the top, you know, Brexit, well, you know, the wretched Brits, they were half out anyway. They weren't in Schengen. They weren't in the Euro. That Farage, he's always, you know, we didn't want them anyway. Quite. And then the Hungarians and the Poles, well, you know, they, you know, they were never really Europeans, were they? You know, God, we took them in because it was that or, you know, we had to kind of bring them in after the fall of the Berlin Wall. But, you know, when you've got the third biggest, uh, you know, it's not called the Treaty of Rome for nothing, mm. Uh, uh, mm. the third biggest uh, economy in the Eurozone, uh, uh, basically coming to European summits and, we haven't talked about immigration policy, but essentially, uh, 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 you know, adopting positions that are fundamentally, you know, the antithesis of the core Eurozone. I mean, Mr. Macron's reforms now uh, potentially look pretty shaky. So I think it is a big moment. And a different attitude towards Russia as well. Again, I mean, 
which Italy has had for a long time. Uh, you know, if you if you talk to senior Italian officials, Italy uh, there's a lot of Itali- uh, Russian money uh, uh, in 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 Italian banks. There's a lot of Russian money in Italian property, and there's a lot of business interests between uh, Italy and Russia. And they've always been lukewarm about the sanctions that were put on Russia yeah. after the Ukraine crisis. And again, it's one example of where. Uh, in the past, a sort of sensible technocratic government, you know, Gentiloni, uh, uh, Renzi, uh, Mario Monti. These and, Mo- people, and, know, Monti could, could be... and Monti, of course, it wasn't even elected, was it? He was just appointed. No, there have been a, a number. I mean, that's, that, and that's the problem. And so these, these governments have been relied upon, essentially, to toe the line, mm. uh, the sort of sensible line in Brussels. The difficulty they've got now is that's no longer the case. And again, you expect, say, Hungary to be chafing You know, I interviewed Viktor Orban, the prime minister of Hungary. He said, look, you know, we don't like these sanctions on Russia, but we're only a small country. What are we expected to do? Ultimately, we have to toe the line. Now, it will be really interesting to see the next time Russian sanctions come up. If if this five star Lega government holds, uh, you know, what are you going to do when Italy is around the table saying no? Uh, you know, that's a much bigger Quiet. problem than, than, than Hungary. Now, now when um, in Greece we saw a left, very left-wing government elected under Mr Tsipras, Syriza was the name of the party, and they promised to break all of the rules. And I remember I saw Tsipras coming out of that meeting with the European Commission. And I, I looked straight into the eyes of a completely beaten man. I don't know what they threatened him with. <laughs> I mean, goodness only knows. But suddenly having been elected on this populist wave of we're not going to obey these German-dominated rules, he basically collapsed and caved. What pressure do you think they're going to try and bring on this new Italian government to toe the line? I think there will be massive pressure, and it'll come partly from the markets. You know, if, if it looks like... I mean, a bit like when Trump was elected, no one was quite sure what Trump was going to do. Was he really going to carry on? And it will be interesting to see whether they can, in the face of market pressure, which will build, you know, once, you know, Italian debt... Debt, debt spreads, the, you know, the gap between the price of an Italian bond and a German bond starts to yeah. widen, then then you'll find, you know, debt, Italian debt to GDP ratio is 130%. And they will find themselves under huge pressure to finance, you know, the cost of Italian debt. And that will, my guess is, probably limit what they can actually do. And then you're going to have more angry Italians because an, yet another government has failed to deliver on its promises, yet another government. and that And so that will push them to push the Europeans very hard. You see what I mean? You end up in a push and pull yeah. situation where the markets and, and, the, and the Eurozone authorities squeeze them to say, you just can't do this. But we've promised people. And the danger for the Europeans is that actually the government falls and you end up with even more angry Italians. Yeah, um, and they you don't, you don't have, solve the problem. And they don't have... I mean, you, you could always argue in France and Germany, however imperfect Brussels is, you know, three wars in the space of 70 years between those countries, there is some residual love for the project in both of those countries. Italy, of course, doesn't have any of that. I mean, let me ask you, Peter, straight. Do you think that this Italian government poses a bigger threat to the European Union project than Brexit? Uh, yes, I do. OK. Uh, I, I, I do. Well, uh, that's a pretty uh, straight it's, answer, it's, and, I, and I'm with you 100%. Peter Foster, thank you very much indeed for joining us. That was Peter Foster, Europe editor of the Daily Telegraph, and, yeah, that's the premise I'm putting to you. I think this poses a bigger threat to the future of the European Union than Brexit ever did. I've got Rhys from Lambeth on the line. Good morning, Rhys. Good morning, Nigel. Um, do, do you agree with my uh, prognosis here? Yes, yes, I do, because um, the thing about um, the UK is we're not integrated into the euro currency the same way that Italy is. So if a country like the UK was to leave, or Denmark, or Sweden, or Hungary, yeah, it'll pose a threat, but not the biggest threat, because what holds the EU together most is um, the Schengen Zone, and the euro currency now. If Italy does leave the euro currency, it seems as though the five-star movement and Lega Nord or Nord, as it's now called a contract. Yeah. I still think um, if, it, if they decide to go forward with it, if, Germ- if um, Italy leaves, potentially other countries will leave the euro and then the whole thing's pretty much kaput, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, Reese, I think that. And I, I understand Peter Foster's point that the markets will put pressure on. It may start to be difficult for the Italian government to Definitely. borrow. They've got this massive you know, accumulated debt, which is 132%, 132%. Yeah, yeah, of annual GDP. So they've got some real problems. I mean, the real problem, Reese, is that Italy should never have joined the euro. It's been a catas- catastrophic mistake. Nigel. It's a terrible currency. Um, it was 
it, it, it has caused so much misery for the Italians. I'm glad we never joined. If we did, bloody hell, where would we be now? Well, I think if we joined it, um, I, I'm not sure Brexit would have happened, because I think the argument... It would have been difficult for it to happen. For yeah, because yeah, the yeah. argument, how do you unravel this, would have been very, very difficult indeed. Um, Reese, uh, do you think the end of the European Union would be a good thing, or potentially quite dangerous? I'm probably going to say something that's going to offend a lot of people. I think it's one of the best things to happen in Europe since the fall, um, since 1945. It was a terrible union. It's never been created. If it was just a common market, fine. But it's now become a political union. I'm glad we've left the, left the bloody stupid thing. I hope okay. I en- the same as well. Enough of the B word this time on a Sunday morning. Yeah. Reese. Thank, <laughs> thank you very much for your call. Marcus on Facebook says, The new Italian government and Brexit are both huge threats to Brussels. They know that the other European nations will follow soon. It's taking time, but the lions are roaring. Brexit was the start. Hubert says, A danger for a union of 27 countries, its leaders, and 450 million citizens, question mark. The EU economies are going from strength to strength. Britain has a lot of catching up to do. Well, Hubert, we've had times over the last 15 years when we have been growing more quickly than the Eurozone. Right now, the Eurozone is growing more quickly than we are. We have a productivity problem in this country. Lots of people in work, but not enough being produced. Uh, But the idea, as I said at the start, that we're the ones with the problem, that everything's fine and dandy in Brussels and around the member states, just isn't true. They are facing a really, really big problem. So tomorrow, the Five Star Movement and the League will go to the Italian president and they will form a new government. They have a platform. Uh, One or two of the early ideas, such as demanding Brussels right off, 250 billion euros worth of debt appear to have been dropped. Uh, But they are talking about the repatriation of half a million illegal migrants. They are talking about ending sanctions on Putin's Russia. Uh, They are talking about an affirmation that Italy is a Christian country. Um, And they've got a whole raft of spending plans that would probably put them at double the limit for the size of their economy that is allowed that is allowed by the Brussels rules. Now, the only question to be sorted out tomorrow is who is the Prime Minister going to be? No one quite knows, but I love this quote. There is a certain Silvio Berlusconi who has nine years of experience in government and is available. Guess who said that? Silvio Berlusconi. So at 81 years old... He uh, has decided that he wants to be the Prime Minister again. I don't think they're going to pick him. But it's interesting, because Berlusconi's party... These two parties have 50% of the vote. Berlusconi's party is about another 15 16% of the vote. So what you're beginning to see is Italian mainstream politics is now very much of a Eurosceptic disposition. And Theo on Facebook uh, makes a point of this. He says, surely this is a bigger threat to Brussels than Brexit because we're talking about a coalition of Eurosceptic parties, unlike Brexit. In Britain, the people may have opposed the EU, but not really the mainstream political parties. So, I, you know, I think this does pose a very fundamental threat. There could be all sorts of market dislocation. Um, I personally, of course, am not a fan of the European project. I think it would be far better if sovereign states cooperated together rather than being run by the European Commission. That's my view. But Jason in Sutton, who's a regular caller to this show, often takes a different view. Good morning, Jason. Good morning to you, Nigel. Good morning. Happy sun- Sunday to you. Um, why is it you just pick on a, con- any country with a problem, you find the problem, and then blame it on the European Union? It just fascinates me. You know, oh, to- well, Jason, what I'm saying, of course, is that joining the euro was a catastrophic error for the Italian economy. And they've basically had zero growth, Jason, for 20 years. And yet, if Britain had joined the euro back in 1997, we would be 30% wealthier than we are what? today as a country in the Britain. You're having a laugh. No, you can look at the fact. Any of you can look at <laughs> Jason, the fact if we joined the euro, we'd have been like Greece with our budget deficit. Goodness knows what would have happened to us. It would have been a catastrophe well, if we joined the euro. Well, so say some, but uh, we'll never know, will we, apart from the f- historical facts. But if you look at um, Italy, it's got 250 billion euros of debt with the European, other European Union countries. Yep. You can't say that that's the fault of the European Union. No, 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 no. Countries, Where would they have gone if they were not members of the European Union? Where would they have had to go to get that money? They had something called the lira, Jason. And 
and, and, and of course, the lira very often went through stages of competitive devaluation. Now, you could argue that a country that uses devaluation isn't actually tackling the social um, economic problems that it's got itself. But the point is, as soon as you, you, you merge your currency with effectively the Deutschmark, because that's what they did, then unless your economy and your structures become like Germany's, you've got a problem. And you have two choices. With the lira, you could devalue your currency. With the euro, they've had to devalue the country. And I'm saying, Jason, they should never have joined the euro. But that's one out of, what is it, 19 eurozone countries? Oh, there are many others. Oh, oh, there are many others, Jason. What, What the problem is caused by is total mismanagement by a series of governments that don't know what they're doing in Italy, including the technocratic one. And this goes back a long time. It's nothing to do with the European Union or the currency. Otherwise, all 19 countries would have the same problem. You're picking one problem and blaming... Jason, there there is a cultural division between the north of Europe and the south of Europe. A cultural division in terms of attitudes towards work. Um, a cultural attitude towards government, towards paying taxes. I mean, these differences, I believe these differences are irreconcilable. Now, I was arguing that, Jason, back in 1999, you know, all the way through the formation of the euro. And, 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 and frankly, uh, you know, those in Brussels thought, ah, once we get them in the straitjacket, they will change their government, they'll become more efficient, they'll become more like the Germans. But it's very difficult to culturally change people. Oh, hang on. The tax avoidance isn't just the the, the, part, the policy of the Southern Europeans. I mean, there's yourself with the Isle of Man pension scheme. Jason, let me, let me tell you, Jason, I did business in Italy. I did business in Italy. £34 billion, pounds, 34 billion pounds of unpaid corporate taxes in the UK. Thirty-four billion pounds is what we're losing. We're not collecting. All right. It. So, Jason, are you saying to this show that culturally attitudes towards tax avoidance are the same in Britain and Germany as they are in Greece and Italy? I don't think it's tax avoidance as such. It's more of a cash economy over there. Jason, because- I'm sorry, but I'm sorry, but my seven years. My seven years of dealing with major Italian companies have taught me different. Anyway, we, we are where we are. Do you, Jason, think this Italian government poses a threat to the future of the European project? I think it poses a threat to wider, wider areas than that. I mean, I can't think of another uh, sort of far-right fascist almost government um, in Italy since the Second World War. Oh, the, uh, b- please believe me, the Five Star Movement are more to the left of politics than they are to the right. And that's a good thing. I'm not so sure it is either. Well, no, but the point I'm making is you yeah. can't call them fascist. I mean, Beppe Grillo, you know, the stand-up comedian who founded that party, I mean, that party has what we would call a big social conscience. They're not right... they're not right-wing? No, they're not right-wing at all. So how come you've been hanging out with them so much? Uh, because I've always, uh, Jason, worked with people from the right, centre and left of politics to achieve my goals. And those that want to pigeonhole me somewhere, uh, well, they've tried jolly hard, but they're losing. Jason, as ever, I thank you for your call. Messages flowing in. All thanks go to Italy for this favour to us. Let's hope the whole bucket blows up in Brussels' face and there'll be no... EU for us to leave. Graham, I've been saying for years, you know, I want us to leave before the whole thing falls to pieces. I would lose a great sense of satisfaction if we couldn't do this. Italy will put even more nails in the EU Commission's coffin. Perhaps it's time our Euro fanatics woke up and smelt the coffee. Richard, I keep saying this every week. You know, those, the Lord Adonises and these people who want us to basically stay in the European Union, what are we staying in? We're staying in something that I think is increasingly fragmenting. John is calling from Los Beliches in Spain. Good morning to you. Good morning to you. Um, I'm more concerned. I think the, the Italian situation, they're probably putting enough pressure on Italy to the, the new government to water things down. But what concerns me more, what we don't hear too much about, is we've had a 10-year record of a bull market, as you know. We have. The record. We have. Uh, I think Trump, the Trumponomics has probably uh, increased the chances of not having one in the next year or two. But, you know, when crashes come, and I've basically seen them all, they come very fast and many, many people can't recognize them coming. And that, to me, is, is the biggest worry about the EU, because effectively Germany is going to have to put billions into Eastern Europe and the Mediterranean countries, the East Mediterranean countries, 
countries and I don't think the German people would want to put well, the billions in Well, John, I mean, the politics of Germany is changing, isn't it? I mean, the, the, you know, the AFD, the, you know, the alternative for Deutschland, they are now second in the opinion polls in Germany. Yep, un- understandable. And, uh, and I don't think with that pressure that Merkel is much, much weaker than she has been. And a consequent, I think the next crash we get, I think Europe's going to crash too. I don't think the UK would have been too much bothered with the Euros joining the Eurozone because we know how to have our own currency. And I think the biggest downfall of the Euro, problem of the Euro, is that no harmonization of anything before it was brought into being. And also the fact that the UK, the major countries like Germany, Germany's probably working with a currency 30% discount to what it should be. The UK probably, probably would have been on par, but it's very detrimental to countries such as the Mediterranean countries, which could be working with a currency maybe 20% below what it is now. Uh, but they're not. John, I, I have to say, I have to say, I think you're right. I think there's no reason why Brexit can't be done without severe economic dislocation. But it's very difficult to see how the Eurozone breaks up without very big risks to the markets. And yeah, I, absolutely. Yeah, and I agree with that. Uh, I still think long term it's the right thing to do. I, I, I take the political view, John, that had Europe been a cooperative club, it might have been a success, but it massively overstretched itself, and the euro perhaps being the best example of that. Yeah. Anyway, I'll sign off and say to you, um, give my regards to Manuel. Well, I certainly will. I certainly will. John, thank you. And I will be in Brussels this week, where I'm going to be meeting Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah, he's coming to meet the Conference of Presidents, the heads of political groups, uh, and that'll happen on Tuesday evening. Um, I will get the opportunity to ask him a question. Uh, It's not going to be videoed or filmed, but the event will be minuted. Um, And I will, over the course of the next 48 hours, come to some of you and ask you what kind of areas uh, and what kind of worries do you have about your personal privacy using Facebook. And I know a lot of people are very concerned indeed. Mick takes the view that Italy will cave in and toe the line um, because the EU will threaten them. Well, Mick, the EU will threaten them. The EU do threaten people and the EU always seem to win by using those tactics. But there is a day coming, there is a day coming uh, when that is just not going to be the case. We could be very close to it. Now, Italy could be about to blow up the whole European Union project, and I think it's a really major news story that is not getting the kind of debate and coverage that it should be, but it will, over the course of the coming weeks and months. Mind you, not many stories really are getting much coverage in the newspapers today, because there was a certain event that took place in Windsor yesterday, and everyone seems to be talking about it. To help me through this, I'm going to get people watcher Andrew Pierce, columnist and consultant editor of the Daily Mail, and of course, LBC presenter on Friday evenings from 7 till 10. And Andrew, you were there in Windsor yesterday. I was, Nigel. It was memorable, actually. Uh, You never know what to expect. I covered the uh, wedding of Prince William and Kate Middleton, uh, which was great, but it was Buckingham Palace, it was central London, it was Westminster Westminster Abbey. The the, the setting of of, uh, Windsor Castle was just magical, actually. It is almost like a a fairy tale location. If a Hollywood producer, Nigel... Yeah. If it's a royal wedding, it would be Windsor with those glorious grounds, those glorious turrets and battlements. And the royals do pageantry so well. So after all the disasters of the build-up to the wedding with Meghan's father, Meghan's father Woody or Wenty, and those ghastly uh, sisters and brothers t- saying terrible things about her, they pulled it as ever. They pulled, they pulled it off, and it was a brilliant spectacle. And the atmosphere was extraordinary. Yeah, I mean, I was there on Thursday, Andrew, and so 48 hours before the wedding, yeah. and, you know, the household cavalry were doing marching and drill and practising, and there were thousands of people. And I thought even on Thursday it seemed a pretty remarkable buzz about the place. And I agree with you. I think, uh, I think, I mean, I was on the Fox News set, and it kind of, it looked so unreal. It was almost like Disney. It looked so extraordinary. And, I know. It, it is our version of Camelot, isn't it, really? Uh, absolutely. And, uh, Absolutely. There's and, huge, and there's huge affection for Harry as well, because not least, I think, because he lost his mother at such a young age. Everybody remembers that iconic image of little Harry, aged 11, walking behind his oh. mother's 
coffin, which was heartbreaking to watch. And then to see him so happy with this uh, remarkable young woman who is mixed race, she's divorced, wouldn't Diana approve? <laughs> You're probably right in that, in every sense, actually. But, Andrew, he was the rebel prince, wasn't he? He was. He was. He was the carouser. He was the party animal. He was the guy that broke the rules. And it didn't matter, because he was never going to be king anyway. Um, and and I, I didn't seem to see many of his old drinking mates um, in, in Windsor yesterday. It seemed to be sort of A-listers. I mean, has she changed, Harry? I su- well, I suspect she's changed him a bit. I think all, all young men quieten down a bit. I know what I was like in my 20s, but I think he has tamed him a bit. Uh, I mean, there were one or two of his mates there, don't you worry. Guy Pe- I spotted Guy Pelly, who was one of his drinking partners. Yeah. I think he was at that infamous party where uh, Harry, who was only 18, for God's sake, was wearing Nazi uniform. Uh, but uh, it was fascinating to see people like George Clooney and, and Amal there and uh, e- e- Idris Elba. Because you have to remember, she was she's a pretty accomplished actress in her own right suits was pretty big i'd never watched it of course but i'm no great judge of uh popular tv but it had a big following in the united states a huge following in canada where it was filmed and boy she didn't look nervous did she she was reveling oh, yeah. every moment of it no 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 she was a complete star in every sense yesterday but parts of the service were should we say unconventional and i wonder yeah, I mean, how did the Duke of Edinburgh look during <laughs> during the sort of alternative sermon? Well, if he stayed awake, that would have been quite something. Because, you know, the Queen has a rule. Uh, speeches, sermons should be uh, sh- no shorter than two minutes, no longer than seven minutes. Yeah. And our dear Bishop from Chicago went on for 13 minutes. He went on and on. And you could sense people. I, I mean, I think actually some of the royals, some of the younger royals were laughing. I'm sure Zara Phillips was chuckling. Well, Charles sure looked like he was did. laughing, didn't he? Yeah. They just knew he'd gone completely over the top. (laughs) It was his his great opportunity for this bishop, and he was completely, completely hammed it up, didn't he? Every moment, every every time it got to a certain point, I thought, phew, he's finished. And then he'd be off again uh, with this great philosophical uh, conversation about faith and fire. What was all that about fire anyway? I I don't know. I I thought he was sent for the fire brigade or something. Uh, and, And there was very little about the couple, of course. But that's because, of course, he doesn't know them from Adam. Uh, but you know why he was there. He was a black bishop, and that was a symbolic statement because of Meghan Markle being mixed race. And because, of course, you know, the Queen is head of 15 states, and many of them are in the Commonwealth, and many of the people of the leaders there are Africans and black yes. people. So uh, you get it, but somebody should have said to uh, the bishop, uh, seven minutes and sit mm. down, mate. And overall, a good advert for the country? Oh, it's fantastic, isn't it? I mean, you couldn't make it up. I mean, wherever I walked yesterday, there was TV being broadcast to the United States, to yep. Canada, the Caribbean, Australia, New Zealand. And I bumped into one of the um, local dignitaries. I think he was a mayor or something. And I said, this has really put um, Windsor on the map. He said it was already on the map. He said, but now it's on, gone on, on the map. Mm. 360 degrees of the globe. Fantastic. It must be worth tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions, in terms of uh, a showcase for Britain. I mean, how much would it cost to advertise Windsor in that way on TV worldwide? Yeah, and I mean, and, Andrew, when you and I were growing up, there were voices in the House of Commons and elsewhere calling for the abolition of the monarchy. Uh, there was quite a, you know, there was a quite a strong strain of republicanism that, that had always existed, in fact, in this country. It had been there for centuries. I think they're going to be keeping quite a low profile now, don't you? I absolutely do. And of course, Jeremy Corbyn, we know, didn't watch the Royal Wedding. He was at some boring Labour economics conference. OK, he's the leader of the opposition. That's what he has to do. And we know he is a Republican, but he's made it quite clear if he was prime minister, he would do nothing to upset. Yeah, it's not a vote winner, world. is it? It's they not a no vote. <laughs> no. and, 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 you know, I, I, it's quite interesting. A lot of people are talking about why the Duke of Sussex. Little known fact, uh, Nigel, the first Duke of Sussex and the only Duke of Sussex spent a time living in the United States. States shortly before uh, or shortly after George III lost the colony. Uh, so they, the royal family picked that title for Harry and for her with great meticulous precision in, in all they do. The only one, so he's now the second yeah. one, and the last one lived in the United States for a bit. So that's quite simple. And was a rebel, wasn't he? 
He certainly was. He had two marriages, neither of which were recognised by the monarchy because he didn't get permission of his dad. Pretty tricky to get permission of his dad. His dad was George III, and if anybody watched the film... He was crackers, wasn't he? There was a film called The Madness of George III. (laughs) He was round the twist. Yeah. Not easy to get permission from a monarch who's bonkers. Andrew, thank you very much indeed for joining us this Sunday morning. It was Andrew Pearce, who... Well, you know, you could say Pierce is a cynical Fleet Street hack. He was blown away by what he saw in Windsor yesterday. And yes, we do wish the Duke and Duchess of Sussex very well indeed. Back to Italy. I'm bombarded by your messages. Kevin makes the point that it's a great shame these countries didn't take action before the EU bankrupted them. It will turn into a very nasty situation. Europe is in big trouble. I think Europe's in big trouble, Kevin. Uh, But as I say, I think the breakup of this project, the breakup of this currency, and I'm not saying it's going to come immediately, but I think the signs are there. Um, It could be a very, very painful business. Tina thinks the euro has been a disaster, and so is Schengen. Um, Well, why people still say it's so wonderful is beyond me. Yeah, but, you know, we had Jason on earlier, who was a strong defender of the European principle, and he blames bad management and bad government in Italy. But, hey... They've always had bad governments. Ian is calling from Feltham. Good morning, Ian. Uh, Good morning, Nigel. Uh, About the Five Star uh, Movement and the Northern League. Yes. uh, To me, it's like a a stack of dominoes that are going to collapse all over Europe. Because you've you've got Syriza in Greece that tried their best to try and sort the problems out. You've got Marine Le Pen, who was kept out when the rest of them all ganged up against her, keep her out of her office. You've got the Hungarian government that hasn't let any immigrants in at all, as far as I know. Uh, You've got Austria, I think it's lurching to the right. Uh, Because these countries, the people, not the countries, have been forced into a corner by the, uh, basically, the European Union, which is basically the Bundesbank, or you could even call it the Fourth Reich, financially, if you like, by dominating Europe through finance instead of uh, military power. Uh, and the people have just basically got nowhere to go. The, the German point is a very, very important point. You know, Salvini, Matteo Salvini, who leads the Lega, um, and they stunned everybody by getting 17% of the vote. By the way, I saw an opinion poll on Friday putting his party now at 25% of the vote. So he is the rising star in many ways of Italian politics. But he wants to renegotiate the EU's key treaties because he says, at the moment, we are completely dictated to by the Germans. So there is a growing anti-German sentiment um, spreading throughout much of Europe. Um, The question is, Ian, will these people stick to the plans that we've read about this morning, or will they back down? Will Juncker and the others put the thumbscrews on them and make them, as Brussels thinks, see sense? I I think they'll back down a bit. But uh, it's a shame about Germany, because uh, I talk to German people, they want the mark back Yep. They want uh, uh, more independence for nations, and it's uh, people will be smeared by the behaviour of their own government and the Central European Commission. Ian, do you know what? I will, I'll bet anybody that uh, it's difficult, it's retrospective, but had the Germans had a referendum on giving up the Deutschmark for the Euro, Ian, you and I both know how they would have voted. And that is the problem. This European project's effectively been foisted upon people who didn't really want it. Is Italy going to blow up the European project, or will they back down in the face of Brussels telling them, do this, and your people will suffer financially very heavily indeed? Before I get back to that, uh, John Burko has been a regular feature on my show ever since I joined the staff at LBC. Um, I am not a fan of John Burko. I do understand uh, that in some ways he's given backbenchers a little bit more power, a little bit more ability to speak in the Commons since he had the job. Uh, But I, for many reasons, don't like John Burko. Least of of all because... The Speaker, for 800 years, has been neutral. Even during the English Civil War, the Speaker managed to stay neutral. And we have a Speaker who is politically partial. Remember his comments about Donald Trump, for example. Well, he's in a lot of trouble now, I think. Uh, We've had a succession of stories about him. uh, Well, bullying is the accusation that gets made, but being pretty short with with people, shouting at people. Um, And this kind of got a bit worse, I think, at the end of last week. Um, where he described a senior minister 
as a stupid woman, um, and he was referring to Andrea Leadsom. Um, he also said she was effing useless. Um, Downing Street has called this language and this behaviour unacceptable. So, you know, for number 10 to say the Prime Minister thinks this is unacceptable means this whole thing has actually moved up a gear. Um, and I have to say uh, that uh, even though uh, there is no official investigation now going to happen into bullying. I think he is beginning to lose the support of the chamber. He's pretty much lost the support of the commentariat, many of whom thought he was a bit pompous, but thought he was doing quite a good job. And I, I have said that already. He, you know, quite a lot of backbenchers thought, in terms of the job, he was doing it OK. It's just his personality and the fact that he isn't politically neutral. And I, I, I genuinely think um, that it would be better for Mr Burko to stand down to resign rather than get forced at some point out of that office in a very undignified way. <laughs> That's my view. Back to Italy. Is this new Italian government a bigger threat to the European project than Brexit? Sarah is calling from Leeds. Good morning, Sarah. Good morning, Nigel. Well, my answer is I bloody hope so, because... <laughs> now, now, why is everyone using the B word on this Sunday morning? But uh, c continue without using it, Sarah, please. Well, I'm just delighted by the election uh, results, and I just feel that now we're just turning the page. Um, and I, I've just grew, grew up, I've lived through uh, growing up in Italy yep. uh, when we, we had the lira. Uh, life was so much better we, before we, we changed to the euro, we joined the European Union. And I think it's just been, it's just, it hasn't done the country any good. Uh, as you know, we all escaped Italy. People, you know, when I go back, and I don't, people are pretty desperate about the situation and employment, everything else. And now the the migration crisis is just uh, well, and industry, Sarah. But I, I mentioned earlier, back in the nineties, uh, when I was working in the metals business, uh, you know, my firm had customers in Italy, and they were the big industrial manufacturing giants of northern Italy. And kind of, in terms of their production, Sarah, they kind of challenged Germany in many ways 20 years Absolutely, ago. Absolutely, massively. And now where all the manufacturers have been, have been moved away from, from, the, from the country. And I, I just think, um, and I just don't like, I don't mind what the EU is trying to do, like homogenise the whole continent. It, it doesn't um, work, does it? It doesn't work with different, you know, that chap Jason before said, uh, oh, it's the, the fault of the Italian government. Yes, it is, because we have massive problems with the mafia and everything else and the corruption in the government. But we, we managed before and we're never going to be like Germany. It, we, culturally, there, it is a, it's a massive yeah. different mentality. Yeah. This, is, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is the key to it, Sarah, isn't it? it, 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 you know, you know, it is. How on earth... Germany and Greece, or Germany and Italy, can be together. And it's not just a single currency. It's supposed to be a full economic, monetary, and ultimately political union. It isn't going to work. Sarah, do you, do you still have a vote in Italy or not? Yes, yes, I did. I did. But uh, I left quite young. So I have to say, I just, uh, I've never been really involved in, you know, in politics. It's just in the last few years. I, I just took a, a real interest in, you know, and now here in Brexit as well. Mm. And, and which, Sarah, I mean, as I say, I know Beppe Grillo quite well, the founder of the yeah. Five Star yeah. Movement, and behind him there was a guy called Gian Roberto Casaleggio, who frankly oh, was yeah, a... a the, the techie... Yeah, the techie I mean, what well, about yeah. techie, genius, I think's the word I would use, Sarah. I yeah, mean, yeah. You, you know, he, he completely understood the full potential of social media. He got Beppe, uh, you know, up to four to five million Twitter followers, huge numbers of Facebook followers. Yes. Uh, they set up a political party as an, an online platform. It's actually something I wanted to do with you, Kit, but they weren't interested, sadly. Um, but, but, and, and Casaleggio's now died. But for them to have gone from nowhere to getting 32% of the vote... Oh. We've had, the, in my town where I come from, we've had the, I mean, it's, uh, um, you know, council, it was just hugely corrupt. People are getting arrested, left, right, and centre when yep. I was growing up. And we've had uh, a five-star mayor for the last four years. Mm -hmm. And it's been such a, so much positive change. You know, actually, the money was being spent on the roads, on the town, on the park, just improving the town. It's just, 
And I do believe that Di Maio is a good guy. I, I hope they're not going to be uh, persuaded or intimidated because I, I, I do believe he's going to do what he says. Well, well S- he Sarah, they are going to come under the most extraordinary pressure. Already there are European commissioners telling them, don't do this, don't do that. It's going to be a battle royal. Sarah from Leeds, thank you. And she's thrilled at this new government. Christopher on Facebook says, this is a massive blow to the EU, physically and symbolically. All those Eurosceptic countries may do one of two things. They'll all walk away, or they'll all join together and become a nightmare for the EU. So, Christopher, about ten years ago, a French newspaper said, Nigel Farage is Brussels' worst nightmare because he wants Britain to leave the European Union. In some ways, Viktor Orban, the Hungarian Prime Minister, he's now the EU's worst nightmare because he doesn't want to leave. He intends to stay in the club and break all of the so-called rules. June is calling from Dartford. Good morning, June. Good morning, Nigel. Hi there. So, how do you view this new Italian government? Very exciting. I was just saying to your researcher, um, we've got the EU elections coming up next year. Um, Get it flooded with new MEPs from uh, Italy, Hungary, Poland, everywhere. You are a sceptic, and he's pleased to carry on your fantastic work. This is coming from a UKIP member from Dartford. Yeah, well, do you know what? On the do, you, do you know what? I, um, I, um, after 20 years, I'm very pleased to be leaving. Um, but in some ways, the next European Parliament pl- promises to be a lot more fun than the previous ones. When I was first there... When I was first there, back in 1999, I mean, you know, Eurosceptics were rarer than hen's teeth. And there is now the prospect in this next parliament of maybe a couple of hundred of them. Is that all? I think we should get... Well, it, it, it may be two, two fifty. I don't know. It could be more. Let's wait and see. Thank you very much indeed. Cool. Time running out. Going to go to Chris in Finchley. Chris, hello. Listen, it's not all the EE's fault Italy's in the position it's in. Italy is not Britain. If it pulls out, it's bankrupt as it is. It, Fiat, the, Fiat Moto, the Fiat Group moved most of its production to South America because it's cheaper labour. It, Italy cannot pull out of Europe. It's not like Britain. Britain has the money to pull out, Nigel. Italy is a co- corrupt, bankrupt society. But, 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 but Chris, my point... on EC money at the time, at the moment. You know that, Nigel, yourself. Chris, I accept, I do accept, Italy has some extraordinary problems, and it, and it really does. But that's the point, Chris, about joining the Euro. And joining the Euro isn't Brussels' fault, it's the fault of Italian politicians for agreeing to it back yes, at the time. Exactly. But all the while they had competitive devaluation with the, with the lira... They could keep their labour uh, prices, uh, you know, for people coming in from overseas at relatively decent levels. Uh, they are stuck in some... Th- I mean, Chris, for this to work, Italy itself has to go through fundamental social and societal change. And it just yes. isn't going to happen, is it? No, the Italians won't stand for... Listen, if you... When the crash, the banking crash happened, Ireland had 80% uh, Austerity measures to get yes. itself out of trouble. Yes. The Italians will not stand for that. You know that, Nigel. They will not stand no, for I, it. No, I, I, I agree. If I agree. you take a company, a British company called Dyson, you know Dyson's? Who yeah, 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 yeah. He moved all his production to Malaysia because it was cheaper. And we still pay the money for it. Britain is a very wealthy country. This country can afford to leave Europe and there'll be no problems, Nigel. But ultimately, Every, Chris... Everybody knows that. Ultimately, Chris, and, and again, another point to make that people don't hoist on board, it's the under-40s in Italy that are voting Eurosceptic. It's the young people right across Europe rebelling against the European Union. We have an anomaly in this country that our younger population are the other way. But, Chris, in the end, if the Italian people want to leave, whatever economic threats they face, they would in the end do it anyway, won't they? Of course they're going to leave, Nigel, but they're already bankrupt. So blaming Europe is, is not the issue. The Italians are in their own destiny. They created this through corruption. You, you've still done business in there. It's yes. Just, listen, Nigel, I've been around a long time. I remember telling people it's four weeks for that park from Italy. You had to wait. In August, September, the whole of Italy closes down. Yeah, I know. I know. No, down. I know. I know. Chris, I thank you. And Italy has got problems. But I have to confess, it's still my favourite European country. Absolutely love the place.